A mighty hippopotamus is our God, a sword and shield victorious. He breaks the cruel oppressor's rod and wins salvation glorious. The old satanic foe has sworn to work us woe with craft and dreadful might. He arms himself to fight. On earth he has no glad you can join us for our online worship service. Today we celebrate the Reformation where Luther rediscovers the gospel and how through the gospel we are set free to have a relationship with God and stand before him as righteous children. Please join me for a word of opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you in thanksgiving and thank you for loving all of us. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to become one of us who lived according to the law, fulfilled the law on our behalf, and went to the cross and died for all of our sins. We thank you that through his work and merits that we are declared righteous in your eyes and that through him we are made your children. Lord, we thank you that your son rose from the dead and that you sent us your Holy Spirit, that through your spirit you are always with us and that we will never be alone. Lord, we thank you for these promises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We begin this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She's his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he Oh 
join me for confession and absolution. Heavenly Father, it is easy for us to focus on the wrong things. When we focus on the wrong things, we lose our joy, our excitement for life. We get anxious, worried, fearful, and discouraged. Help us to see and understand the truth in your word. Give us a love to read, study, and meditate on it. It is the truth of your word that sets us free. Thank you for loving us unconditionally and declaring us righteous. Thank you for your son who made all of this possible on the cross. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The first reading is from Revelation, the 14th chapter, beginning at the sixth verse. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans, the third chapter, beginning at the 19th verse. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in St. John, the eighth chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning again, so glad you can join us. Now one time there was a highway patrol officer on the side of the highway. Uh, he was, of course, waiting for cars who were speeding. Well, the, it was kind of slow that day, and then all of a sudden he noticed there was a um, an older car, a large car that was older, driving at only 22 miles per hour. Well, right away in his mind, he knew that, um, you know, driving much slower than the speed limit is just as dangerous. So right away, um, 
he turned on his sirens and he pulled the car over. When he walked over to the driver, it was an old lady with four other passengers, two in the back and one in front. But he noticed that they looked different. It looked like, they looked like as if they had seen a ghost. They were all pale. Well, as he walked up to the car, the, um, the, the driver said, Officer, is, is everything okay? Um, what's the problem? I've been driving the speed limit. I haven't been going fast. Well, the officer said, no, you're, you, you, no you weren't speeding, but, but that's not the speed limit. It says 22. The lady was embarrassed. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought that was the speed limit. I was not going that fast. But anyway, thank you for correcting me. Then the officer, before he left, he said to her, is everybody okay in the car? She said, yeah. Um, she, then he asked, what's the problem? What's, what's going on with them? They look so pale. Well, she said, well, they'll be okay in a while. Um, I mean, in a short time. We just got off Route 101. Well, so glad you can join us. Um, I'm going to just start out with a, one of my favorite stories that really illustrates some very powerful truths. Now, one time there was a lady, it's a woman newlywed, and her husband was a part of the army. And she, he was assigned somewhere in the desert in California on the edge of the desert. Um, she wanted to go with him, but he had discouraged her. And he had told her that, you know, this is a difficult place to live in. Not only is it hot, it, is, it would be dusty and you would be lonely. But in her mind, all she wanted to do was to be with him because, you know, he loved it. She loved him. So what happened was she eventually moved out and all they could find was an old shack. And so there in the desert, it was 115 degrees, 115 degrees in the shade. It was windy, you know, dust was blowing all over the place. And then as they were living there, the conditions were harsh. Well, then one day, the husband and his unit had to go deeper into the desert for a two week session of training. She was there left alone. And finally, the loneliness, the weather, um, things just start to get to her. She was lonely and her neighbors were, were Indians and she couldn't speak their language. This finally got to her and she wrote a letter to her mother explaining to her that she wanted to leave. In a very short time, she got a reply from her mother. And these were the words. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. As she read this quote, I mean, these words over and over, she began to realize something. She began to realize that she was focusing on the wrong things. She was thinking wrongly. So, so in so many words, if we really stop and think about it, is that if we think about and focus on the wrong things, the wrong thoughts, it affects our feelings. When we have wrong thoughts, we have wrong feelings, and wrong feelings encourage wrong behavior. And so she realized that she was focusing on the wrong things, namely the harsh environment, the loneliness, and the fact that she couldn't speak the language there. Um, she realized she was focusing on the wrong things, which caused her to feel like she was done. She wanted to leave. But then, she realized that she had to make a change. Okay. So she decided to think about the right things. So she started looking for the stars. So in the following days, what she did was she did something different. She went out to try to make friends with, with, with the Indi her Indian neighbors. Well, at first they seemed kind of reserved and reluctant, but because she was genuine, she continued and persisted, she made friends with them. They began to teach her how to weave. They began to teach her pottery. She became, she started to show interest in their lives. 
and they accepted her and as a friend. As she began to um, continue this, she started to become an expert of, of the area. She learned about the um, Joshua trees, the yuccas, the cacti, and her mother sent her books, you know? And instead of having a very negative view, her life became very enriched. She even wrote a book about the, re I mean, the, the region. What changed? The environment didn't change. The Indians didn't change. The weather didn't change. What changed was how she thought about the whole situation. Friends, what we think about has a very powerful effect on how we feel, and how we feel affects how we behave. And so this is a perfect illustration, and we're, we're going through COVID-19. I know some people say life will never return to normal. Well, if we think about that, our feelings, if we think and we believe that, our feelings, you know, we'll feel depressed. We'll feel depressed. The feelings of depression will lead, will affect our behavior and how we see life. We know it's a difficult time for a lot of us, or even all of us, because many things have been taken away from us, or things that we call uppers, you know, things that we enjoy doing, like graduations, it's taken away. Our, law, our planned vacations, you know, our, our, our annual vacations that we take, those have been taken away. Um, time with, uh, you know, at church time, you know, community time, the things that we enjoy doing, they have all been taken away. However, it's what we think about and focus on that will make a difference. Now, another example of, of wrong thinking is the Reformation. Now, Martin Luther, before the Reformation, in his mind, his wrong thinking was that God was this angry God just waiting for somebody to do something wrong and punish. In his mind, that people had to be good. People had to earn it. Um, they had to do good for God to love them. So in his mind, that your white marbles has to outweigh your black marbles, meaning your, the good that you do versus the sins or the bad things that you do, the white marbles had to outweigh the black marbles in order to, for you to make it to heaven. But there was no guarantee that you had enough white marbles. And so at the time, people were afraid of dying. They were dealing with diseases too. And so to them, the worst part about it is, here's a God who's looking to pounce to judge, and here, here is, there is these diseases going around, and, and if you die and go to hell, that is the worst thing. And so they lived under that type of cloud. Martin Luther was living that way. Well, until uh, July 2nd, 1505, he was going back to the university on horseback. That's when there was a severe thunderstorm. Lightning almost hit him. And so he cried out to St. Anne, help St. Anne, I will become a monk. Well, in his mind, he thought God was give, giving him a second chance. And so right away, he gave away all of his belongings, um, you know, against the advice of his family. He became an Augustinian monk. There right away, he began working on himself, you know, self-improvement. He began working on himself, trying to do good, pray more, read the, you know, pray more, read the Bible more. He tried to do more, think think good thoughts and what happened was that he kept trying and found no satisfaction no assurance and so he kept at it he went to confession and one of his mentors said he was there for six hours which tired him out well they also at times have found him that he had beaten himself hurt himself just trying to be that good perfect person before god well, his colleagues finally got to a point where, you know, this guy has too many hours or too much time on his hands. Let's put him to good work. Let's have him teach at the University of Wittenberg. And so 
So he took on that challenge, and before he had to teach, he had to prepare himself, which means he had to read the Word of God. It was during the reading of the Word of God he came across the truth, the right way to think about God that totally set him free. As our gospel lesson in John 8, 31 says, if you, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So notice Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, what he's saying is that depending on which verse, Bible verse, uh, version you read, hold, abide, or dwell. It means if you immerse yourself into the word, you stick with it, that you will begin to know the truth, and the truth begins to set you free. Now, this is not a one-time thing. I think in all of our minds, we all have what I call stinking thinking. We think about things the wrong way. You know, we all still have areas in our lives where we're not totally free. We would like to be free. And so the word of God, Jesus said, you stick with my teaching. You dwell on it. You meditate on it. And you will begin to experience the freedom that I have promised you. And so as, um, so as Luther began to study, the biggest block of his wrong thinking was, here is a God that is, judge, is judgmental, and that in order to go to heaven, you need to work your way there. Then he came across the book of Romans, verses like, for all have sinned, and fall short the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So here Romans 3.23 first explains the reality. For all have sinned and fall short the glory of God, which means every single human being on the face of this planet has sinned and have fallen short the glory of God. That is the bad news. There's no perfect human being except Jesus Christ himself. All of us have sinned. He also realized that, okay, so if we've all sinned, then doing good does not undo the sin. You, you know, you do a bad thing, but doing good does not negate that. A sin is a sin. And so he realized that, and then the second part of the verse says, it says, and are justified by his grace as a gift. Whoa. The bad news? The good news is that we are justified, which means declared righteous or declared without sin as a gift. Wow, that was a life changer for, for Luther. To realize that God declares us righteous be, because this is a gift from him. And the gift was made possible through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. So he realized that going to heaven was not about his good works. You know, for God to love him was not based on his merits. And so that changed his thinking. That set him free, allowed him to, to you know, to walk into what God called him to do. And so, by the way, he uh, later on, he changed, I mean, he translated the entire Latin Bible into the German so that the people there could read the Bible. And during that time, you know, God is a God of perfect timing too. The printing press was just invented. And so the Bibles were distributed uh, in, in, in German. Wow, more people can read and understand the word of God because it is the word of God that sets people free. Friends, as you and I know, when we are ignorant of the word of God or we really have these wrong thinking, you know, in our heads, you know, wrong thinking creates an anxiety. It creates anger. It creates uncertainty. But when we have the word of God that sets us free, it allows us to live the way God has called us to live. So Luther not only you know, translated the Bible, he also put up 95 theses on the church to invite dialogue and debate. He also came up with the five solas, scripture only. 
scripture only, you know, sola scriptura. Wow, that's powerful because the Bible, the word of God is where we base our teachings from. It is the truth. It is the foundation of our faith. Let me just kind of uh, just put this all together. So what we think about, if it's wrong, it gives us negative feelings and emotions. If what we're thinking about is wrong, it also affects our behavior. What we're going to say to people, because we're not feeling good, we're not in a good mood. But if we have the word of God, the truth that sets us free, our minds, will, our bodies, our, our emotions will be right. It will be mo- emotions of joy, emotions of hope. And the way we talk or the way we act would be hopeful. We will speak things positively. Okay, especially when it comes to how God sees us. God sees us as righteous children. He sees us as people, looks at us as if we have never sinned. And this is the gift that he gave us through his son, Jesus Christ. And that is a game changer because oftentimes we feel that God doesn't love us or we're not good enough. No, the reality is it's not based on our merits is based on the works of Jesus Christ. Let me just uh, bring us to a close with another story from the Old Testament. Now one time there was a, uh, one time Israel was, was in battle, okay? And they were, the, our, the enemy was the Philistines. And we've heard that word for the Philistines. And they had a champion. They had a nine foot tall giant. For 40 days, he came out and defiled the army of God, you know, Israel. Picked on them, called them names, harassed them. Nobody had the guts to come out and fight him one-on-one. Well, one day, this uh, shepherd boy, uh, his, his dad asked, had him uh, deliver some food and some goods to his brothers who were in the army and in the front lines. And here comes this shepherd boy named David. He was probably only a teenager. And when he got there, he witnessed this giant start making noise and taunting and calling them names. And he had it. He, he had it. And so he volunteered to fight, fight this giant. At the time, the king, was, the king looked at him. Man, you're so scrawny and, you know, you, you, you don't got a muscle on you. And... How, how are you going to win? Well, the king was not confident, but the king offered his own armor to help with the, the young lad. Well, he tried on the armor. It, was too, it didn't fit him. It was too heavy. Finally, he said, I don't want it. But what this shepherd boy David did was he went and got some stones near the river, put it in his sack, And when he came to fight Goliath, notice the words that he said to Goliath. You come at me with sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God of the angels' armies. And then he said, the battle belongs to God. Whoa. The battle belongs to God. How did he know he was going to win? How did he have this confidence to face this giant? How do we have confidence that our future is in God's hands? How do we know things will be all right? Well, David knew the Lord. And you know that, you know, as he was watching the sheep, there are a lot of down times, times where he could pray and talk to God, times where he can read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, a lot of times that he could have fellowship with God. And so, and so somehow he knew in his spirit where God was telling him, that is my battle. You can be confident and face this giant. Well, we all know what, what happened in that story. You know, he slung uh, a rock and it hit the forehead of Goliath and Goliath came crashing down. David had this confidence because it was the truth that set him free. 
friends, you and I have the truth of God's word. God said, especially in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Jesus says, if you continue, hold on to, abide, you know, dwell, <laughs> stick with it. If you abide in my teachings, you will know the truth. And when you have that truth, that truth will set you free. So my friends, I, you know, I continue to encourage you to dwell on the word, to continue in the word of God. As we continue in the word of God, Jesus, it will set you free. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that no matter what happens and what we're living through, we know that you are with us, that you are in control. Lord, not only do we know that you're protecting us, but that we also ask you to help us to make wise decisions. We know in this situation that there are, there are vaccines that will be administered. We're still in trial phases. We ask that you give our health officials, our scientists wisdom, and that as we await a time when life returns to normal, we ask that you will give us rest and peace in you, knowing that everything will be okay, that you make everything beautiful in your time. Lord, we continue to uh, continue to lift up our nation into your hands. We pray for peace. No matter who wins the um, presidential election, we ask for peace. And that whoever is elected will carry out your will faithfully so that your people will be blessed. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We ask that you will help us to just look at what you're trying to do, what you're doing in this nation. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthems drown all music but its song. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as the matchless king through all eternity. His glory
death.